So, uh, living Lada to see your parish and your planet. I thank Sister Eileen and Sister Margaret and the whole community at Warbank Hall for their presence within the diocese. Warbank Hall and the sisters and staff have long been a place of peace, healing and companionship for so many, um, often in difficult times in their lives. And um, your involvement in, in this um, initiative is, is very much valued. Now in our present times, you continue to play your part in welcoming people in reality and virtually, and offering that hospitality which comes from the gospel. I'm grateful to you for this invitation to offer a reflection as you complete this weekend's workshop. I've not been able to take part in it myself due to other engagements and travel. So please do not look on me as any sort of authority or expert on this subject. Um, you'll have heard many voices speaking about the need to care for creation, and you will have exchanged ideas and come to understand more profoundly the place we have in creation, not above creation. And dipping into Sister Margaret's little pamphlet here, Catholics and Our Common Home, it made me think that the church has a long history here. Um, and the desire to know creation better is an invitation for us to know the creator better. And if creation is given to us as a gift, once we appreciate the gift, we are drawn not to overlook the fact that there must be a giver of the gift. I'll take you back to Ash Wednesday. And when we are anointed with the, the ashes on that occasion, uh, we use two forms of words. The less popular one is, remember that you are dust and to dust you will return. It's interesting that this particular option has largely gone out of fashion for some years, being given second place to the more positive option, which is turn away from sin and believe the good news. And yet the less popular option does hold a profound reflection for us that can be understood as extremely relevant to us in our current circumstances. And so I just repeat it. Remember that you are dust. And to dust you will return. As Sister has said already, uh, I am uh, a keen hill walker. And I'm just messing about with my text here, just excuse me. And uh, being a native of this part of England, uh, I grew up uh, enjoying the, the astounding beauty that, that we have here, perhaps also taking it for granted in many ways. Now, the outdoors have certainly played their part in keeping me well and, in a sense, refreshed throughout my years as a boy, a young man, a priest, and now, when I get chance, as a bishop. Often I've enjoyed the hills alone, but found the company of others, including strangers, not a problem, but a blessing. And going back to the dust theme again, I've discovered more and more on the hills, the presence of, of a new dust, or perhaps more accurately, a grit. Sitting alone on the summit of haystacks on one occasion, even though there was nobody else in sight, I became aware of the presence of someone. Now you'll all automatically be thinking, oh, it means God. Well, no. On that occasion, it wasn't God. I suddenly realized that there I was sitting on the top of Haystacks, a hill in the Lake District, having my sandwiches. And I was sitting 
in what I recognized as, as ashes from, from an urn, you might say. Uh, in all probability, it was someone's ashes that had been scattered at the top of that lovely little, little mountain. Of course, it may have been the remains of somebody's favorite dog. Those mortal remains are also more and, up and more evident on the fells. Sometimes you can find carefully tucked away under a nearby rock or crag, a small plaque identifying the deceased by name and date. Anyway, I wasn't disturbed by the presence of this grit, keeping it well out of my sandwiches, by the way. It was natural that if we understand that we are made of the stuff of creation, there's bits of other people all around us. My love of the hills has been challenged in some personal difficult experiences out there at the late hour or in bad conditions, or on a superb day at the top of Skurnaneg, for example, at the southern end of the Black Coolin Ridge on Sky, when I managed to sprain my ankle badly and I had gone alone and I had told no one where I was or what time I'd be back. And it was a superb day. Other difficult experiences associated with the hills are when I heard, for example, of the death of a friend and parishioner of Martyr Amabilis in Ambleside. Uh, many of you from Lancaster and even further afield might remember Leo Pyle. Uh, he had tragically fallen from the crags on red screes above Kirkston Pass. This happened in spite of him being well equipped, very experienced and sensible. And I don't know if Dimpner is in on this today, but if she is, his, his widow in Ambleside, um, my thoughts and prayers continue to be with her and the family. We should not, not naively fool ourselves about the present climate crisis. Uh, we hear cries that we must do all we can to save the planet. I don't know if that phrase is, is part of your um, reflections and so on. But in truth, the planet is perfectly capable and equipped, experienced, and sensible like Leo, and the planet, in a, in a way, is capable of looking after herself. And let's sort of personalize the planet by calling, referring to her as Mother Earth. She will adapt to whatever we do to her. It will pain her, it will distort her, and disfigure her, but she will somehow cope. What is less certain is whether we will retain a place in her life, whether we will be able to save our place as part of this very astoundingly beautiful ecosystem. Will we be able to sustain our human species as change occurs and particularly given the rate of change. Can you all hear me? Is it coming across loud and clear? Okay. Yes, thank you. Right, good, thank you. The exploitation of resources is one aspect of our relationship with Mother Earth in need of immediate attention. It's a bit like being a spoilt child, putting demands on our parents, um, and a generous parent being so willing and eager to, to, to love us and, and share her bounty, her, her, her affection with us. And yet, as spoilt children do, we take advantage of the generosity of our parents or whoever it is that has what we want. This exploitation has been going on for a long time but has reached a tipping point because of the scale on which it is happening. Many of you are far better informed on this than I am. We must continue to ask, what is motivating the exploitation? 
what hasn't matured in us or what have we lost that um, we're now trying to regain to adjust the balance of things? Um, the motivation question is answered in a number of ways. It can range from sheer commercial greed to the desperation of uh, people caring for their families, trying to feed their, their children or their aging parents or their sick, trying to make a living. Anna, you talked about moving up to Morecambe to live in the, um, and be part of the Eden Project if you could find a job, yeah? So obviously, you know, it's the same across the globe. People need to have some way of sustaining their, their livelihood. Um, another driver, uh, another motive for exploitation is the fear we might have of someone else getting their hands on these resources before we do. We've got to get there first. That's very often something that motivates uh, nations and groups moving into an area that they don't particularly become caring of. They just want to lay claim to it in order to prevent a rival getting their hands on it. We're afraid that someone else might get in there and use it to their advantage and possibly to our disadvantage. You can see this drama being played out in our present times, not just in history, but in our present times across the world's wildernesses that appear on the surface to hold very little of worth, commercial worth. But underneath there may be rich uh, deposits of, of oil or gas or whatever it is that, uh, that, that, that has some sort of value in their um, in their lives. But it's also happening out of sight beneath the oceans. It's happening increasingly in the atmosphere as we, we send more and more satellites and probes and things into the atmosphere. And it's also happening in space. Space exploration can be partly motivated by curiosity and wonder but it can also largely be, um, be motivated and provoked by the fear that, that somebody else will get there first. Sister Margaret has explained in her pamphlet, Catholics and Our Common Home, how the church has been concerned for creation for many centuries. It did not begin with Pope Francis and Laudato Si, although that has been a timely, urgent reminder of and repeating of the church's message about creation. As has been noted, the world on a, a larger scale has at last begun to awaken to the crisis that is upon us. It's not ahead of us, we are in it. And the voice of another mother, we're talking about Mother Earth, but let's talk about another mother, Mother, Holy Mother Church, crying out for care of Mother Earth. It's beginning to gather momentum. We're beginning to overhear the other voices that must be part of this conversation. And it is gaining serious listeners and significant partners. My concern, not just as a bishop, but as Paul Swarbrick, would be that we are not just seen to be climbing on someone else's bandwagon, As the church, we have an obligation to care for creation and to fight against its exploitation alongside others. 
many of whom would not admit to holding formal religious beliefs, and some of whom might actually find formal religious groups quite difficult to, to uh, identify with in any way. My hope is that wherever the church's members are present, we can bring something respectful but extra to the conversation and to the work of potential partners. I say this because we have a knowledge, or we claim a knowledge in all humility of the creator. And we have been given an insight into not just the preciousness of life, but also its purpose. In this sense, creation is experienced as a sacrament, albeit perhaps with a small c, small s. It's a sacrament because it is an outward sign of inward grace. It has an origin. It has a purpose. It's not just a random thing. And ultimately, it will have a fulfillment rather than some sort of spectacular conclusion to bring down the final curtain. Now, the reason why I've not been able to participate in the workshop this weekend is because I was taking part in a, a rally down in London this weekend, the March for Life. And what I mention now is not intended in any way to, to hijack your agenda uh, for the benefit of some other, uh, some other group's agenda. So please bear with me. Um, March for Life in London, it, it was to do with a concern to protect the unborn. And that concern for the unborn must be seen as an essential part, surely, of the climate change debate and agenda. Over our recent months, we've been told by the government to stay at home, which is now largely lifted. We've been told to protect the NHS, that caring agency within our, our society that is ongoing. And we have been told or asked to save lives. And yet each year in the UK, over 200,000 unborn lives are taken by abortion. Since the Abortion Act in the late 1960s, almost 10 million unborn children have been aborted. Now, where does that fit in with saving lives. Should it be save some lives? No, it should not. And as we address the issue of global warming, and climate change, uh, it's worthwhile bearing in mind that if, if we were to succeed as, as a, a world population in in addressing uh, the climate change and getting down the, the, to net zero and effectively in adverted commas, saving the planet, there is, there's still this business going on of um, the human race having this, this issue of um, exterminating so many unborn, innocent lives. Um, and perhaps at this point, I'd just like to read to you, oops, juggling here, but I'd just like to try and read to you a little piece of scripture, uh, which is from the Book of Wisdom. And it's chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. So just two verses. Death was never of God's fashioning. Not for his pleasure does life cease to be. What meant his creation 
but that all created things should have being. No breed has he created on earth, but for, it, for its thriving. None carries in itself the seeds of its own destruction. Think not that mortality bears sway on earth. No time or term is fixed to a life well lived. So it's that little, little phrase, none carries in itself the seeds of its own destruction. And yet, in this country alone, over 10 million, there's something very worrying, there's something very sinister going on there. It's, it is obvious that we must do something to slow global warming because it threatens life on earth. But it is not the only threat. How can we omit this humanitarian crisis as irrelevant to this other humanitarian crisis? Each individual case is a tragedy for all concerned, not just for the child's life lost. But given the scale, again, it's a matter of the scale which, which um, provokes concern, you know, uh, and awakens us. Given the scale on which it is happening, given the way governments have come not simply to accept it, but also approve and promote it, how can we not see this as a symptom of a dilemma that is even greater than climate change. What other species exist or have ever existed that were so intent on their own self-destruction? And I include lemmings in that as well. Um, coming to the last three paragraphs really now, I return to the point that the church's involvement in partnership with other agencies and bodies must serve to make present and make heard a voice that would otherwise be missing from the conversation. If it is not present and not heard, in all probability, whatever achievements are made towards net zero emissions will be of limited value because the greater crisis will have gone unaddressed. The crisis of our self-exterminating, um, the crisis of humanity's disconnect with its creator. And so I thank you, and I, I if I was wearing a hat, I would take it off. But uh, I thank you for, for the way that you are all, each in your own little way, um, trying to let the world hear the voice of the creator. Our place in the fight against global warming is essential as part of our engagement in the mission of Jesus. The mess we are in is due to greed, ignorance, desperation and indifference, and probably many other things too, but those are some of them. May the grace of Christ uphold us in our faith, our hope and our charity, and in the little gestures we make to care for what is our common home in this life, in this world, that we may, please God, in due course, be found fit to be welcomed into the new heavens and the new earth, the place the Lord is preparing for us, our heavenly home. Um, just a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proverb I've used before. The Tonga have many proverbs. And if ever you go to a foreign country or foreign culture, you know, um, one, of the, one of the wonderful ways of getting to know them uh, and engage with them is to is to learn something of their proverbs, which contain their wisdom, their history, their their values, their humour, and tragedy. 
and um, uh, and one of the one of the proverbs uh, of the Batonga, which which I'll some of you have heard it before, so you've probably memorised it. But um, it's worth it's worth hearing because it just it just um, gives you encouragement as an individual. Sometimes you wonder, well, what can I do? I'm only you know I'm only me, um, and the, the problem is so big. And yet the, the Tongas would say Mulonga wahula bunkumunkumu, um, which means the river is full of little drops of rain. That's you lot. The little drops of rain falling, they don't seem to be anything, but bit by bit, they make their way into a great river. And so let that be something that gives you great heart and great encouragement. My concluding personal reflection, uh, let it not be my personal, comfortable and convenient lifestyle that I am trying to save. Um, our Lord Jesus Christ trod the earth so lightly, taking so little from it, just enough for each day. And when he sent out his disciples, he gave them a list of things not essential things that they should take, but essential things that they should not take because he knew that they should rely rather on the hospitality of those they would meet. And in particular, when we're concerned about things like vaccinations across the globe, this is something that, that is extremely relevant, that our mindset is changed to sort of preserving and protecting what we have here um, and what I have and my lifestyle. And I best protect myself uh, in some ways by a very active and generous and sacrificing uh, care for those far away, those I've never met. My Something of my salvation lies in the lives of those strangers, those who in many ways have far less than I have, far less security, far less comfort, far less uh, convenience. But something of my future, my well-being, essentially lies with them too.